Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. From the Gospel of Matthew. Today we celebrate the communion of saints, those both known to us and unknown, bound together in Christ by, by grace, by truth, and by the presence of the Holy Spirit within them. The company of saints is the Catholic Church, and today we focus especially on that part of the Church we call the Church Triumphant, those who have finished their course and now behold the fullness of the beatific vision of God. Not long ago, my family uh, spotted a car one day with a bumper sticker that was curious. For some place, it said, called the Hospital Church. My wife thought perhaps it was part of some hospital ministry, but I suspected it might relate to that old description of the church as a hospital for sinners rather than as a museum for saints. Now that phrase, we don't know where it comes from. It's been attributed to half a dozen different saints. Who knows where it came from, but we do know that it expresses a profound truth. Well, there was a little web address, so we checked it out. Turns out to be a Pentecostal church in Houston. And they have as their motto, where God does the healing. And that fits. The church is a place for shelter and for safety and for healing broken hearts, for mending wounds, especially the wounds of sin, for the medicine of immortality in the sacraments, and for the tough medicine of truth in the word of God. We call the saints saints because of their sanctity, of course. The word literally means the holy ones. And in the New Testament, it's applied to Christians of all kinds, all Christians, regardless of their maturity in personal holiness. But in very short order, even in the New Testament itself, we see how the term saint came to be reserved for those outstanding examples of the heavenly beatitude and virtue that belong to God's kingdom. They are the people that Jesus paints a portrait of in today's gospel and the beatitudes. This is what people in heaven look like. Now, when you think about the amazing virtue and holiness in their lives, it can be a little intimidating. Kind of sounds like they're way up there and we're way down here. It can seem distant and, as a result, a little out of reach. So you start to think maybe sainthood isn't for me. But that's not a realistic viewpoint. It's because we're overlooking their faults whereas we're focused on our own. And those faults, in their case, for some were many, and even of serious magnitude. Of course, we see that in the Bible. Before Saul of Tarsus became St. Paul the Apostle, he was rounding up Christians and throwing them in jail, even women and children, probably subject to tortures along the way. And we know that he consented at least to the murder of Stephen, the first martyr. Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer and, of course, an adulterer. The first saint that Jesus welcomed into the kingdom after his crucifixion was a common criminal who hung next to him on the cross. Saint Moses the Ethiopian was a lustful, vengeful, and violent man who led a gang of 75 criminals. Saint Mary of Egypt gained the reputation for being a prostitute. But she told her biographer that was a vicious lie. She never charged for pleasure. Saint Augustine was a young man who totally gave himself up to vice. He reveled in drunkenness and orgies and scoffed at his mother's piety. His idea of settling down was shacking up with his baby mama. When he came to Christ, of course, he opened up those things in his life for us to read in his confessions. As he himself put it, there is no saint without a past, no sinner without a future. Our God is a God of mercy. He cares more about your future than your past. So don't let your future be held captive to your past. The church is a hospital for sinners. If you are a sinner, and I know you are, 
you're in the right place, a place of grace, the house of God. Consider another saint who began as a notorious sinner, Bartolo Longo. Born in 1841, he was raised in a Catholic Italian family. He attended the University of Naples, which was Aquinas' alma mater. He got good grades and a law degree and was well respected in that field. But he felt a call to the priesthood and was ordained. So where's the naughty part? Where there's a little detail that I failed to mention. He was ordained as a priest of Satan. At the time, the university community was steeped in anti-clericalism, immorality, and the occult, and he indulged in all of it. Bartolo began attending seances, experimented with drugs, attended orgies. Now, his father had died when he was 10, and it seems that he harbored much anger from that. And so he rebelled against his family, against his religious upbringing, he took great pleasure in luring others away from the faith, publicly ridiculing the church of his childhood. But sin and Satanism offered no comfort, and he came to the edge of a nervous breakdown. As with Augustine, it was perhaps really the prayers of Bartolo's family that finally broke down the wall of anger and sin that he had built around himself. One night he heard the voice of his dead father, crying, return to God. He turned to a trusted friend who led Bartolo to a Dominican priest. And after a month of intense counsel, Bartolo returned to Christ and made his confession. But of course, like St. Paul, he struggled with memories of his past. He felt unworthy of God's forgiveness, certain that he was doomed by his past. He wrote, quote, despite my repentance, I thought, I'm still consecrated to Satan, and I'm still his slave and property as he awaits me in hell. As I pondered over my condition, I experienced a deep sense of despair and almost committed suicide. But in that moment, Bartolo remembered the rosary of his childhood. He remembered the love of the Blessed Mother he felt Our Lady tell him that his path to heaven would be through teaching others to pray the rosary, sharing that meditation that ponders the mysteries of our redemption, of how sinners could possibly become saints. He moved to Pompeii, and for more than 50 years, Bartolo preached the rosary, founded schools for the poor and orphanages for the children of criminals, and transformed a city of death to a city dedicated to the mother of God. In the end, he became known so, not so much as a Satanist, but as the apostle of the rosary. If you ever start to feel like you don't belong in a place like this, like you're, like you're beyond God's mercy, remember the sinners, Moses the murderer and David the adulterer, and the thief crucified next to Jesus, and Saul the persecutor, and Moses the gangbanger, and Mary the nymphomaniac, and Augustine the party boy, and Bartolo the Satanist. And remember that you are never beyond redemption. All of them are now saints of God. So they're not remembered that way anymore. They're remembered as Moses the prophet and David the psalmist, and the saint crucified next to Jesus, and Paul the apostle, and Augustine the doctor of the church, and Bartolo the apostle of the rosary. All of them are now saints of God, and I mean God helping to be one too. If you struggle with sin, that might be a hopeful sign. You are in good company. The wicked do not struggle at all. They give in freely. But it is in the struggle with sin that saints are born. They have been there too. They have overcome. They have turned from their evil ways because they found grace and their home in Jesus. That victory that overcomes the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'd like to close with words from St. Bernard of Clairvaux, 
and I hope his sentiment also speaks for you in your heart. The first wish that the memory of the saints inspires in us and urges us to achieve is that we should enjoy their company, striving to deserve to be fellow citizens and members of the household of the spirits of the blessed, to take our place in the gathering of the patriarchs and the ranks of the apostles, to be at home in the assembly of the prophets and in the numerous hosts of the martyrs, welcome in the college of confessors and the choir of virgins, in a word, to be united as the communion of all the saints. Let us pray. O God, the King of saints, we praise and magnify thy holy name for all thy servants who have finished their course in thy faith and fear, for the Blessed Virgin Mary, for the holy patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and for all other thy righteous servants, known to us and unknown. And we beseech thee that, encouraged by their examples, aided by their prayers, and strengthened by their fellowship, we also may be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light through the merits of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.